the delegation from Cote d'Ivoire, the delegation from Nigeria, the delegation from Botswana, the delegation from Ghana, and the delegation from Burkina Faso. A significant portion of household budgets, as we all know, goes to food, a major component of the cost of living. Understandably, there has been animated engagement on this subject after a prolonged drought which pushed the entire Horn of Africa region to the brink of famine. Widespread shortages of stable foods have driven food prices beyond the ability of many households to afford them. Enhancing food production is an intervention with multiple fundamental implications. It promotes access to affordable and adequate food and nutrition for the majority. It also increases food supply, lowers prices, and thus reduces the cost of living. Moreover, subsidizing food production increases jobs and productivity in the country's biggest employer, the agricultural sector. In keeping with our commitment in this critical sector, we have registered 5 million farmers nationwide. These farmers immediately became eligible to receive subsidized fertilizer and those who stepped forward received their full fertilizer requirement unlike in past seasons when the allocations were rationed. As a result of these allocations, as a result of these measures, Kenyan farmers have been able to plant an extra 200,000 acres this year by using an additional 2 million kilos of seed beyond what was planted last year. As international petroleum prices continue to rise beyond reach, the cost of fuel locally raises steeply. Transport as a component of household budget is affecting the cost of living. We have to liberate Kenyans from the reliance on transport that depends on petroleum. For this reason, we are rolling out an electric vehicle public transport system which will bring down the cost of transport significantly. Our border border industry is about to experience inclusive transformation through the introduction of more efficient, affordable, and clean motor uh, vehicles. With this intervention, owning and operating a border border will become affordable, secure, and profitable. I am eager that this information reaches the seconder of my presidential nomination, Mr. Calvin Ocheng who operates in Kilimani, so that he can escalate his hustle to the next level. I want, I have some good news for my border border friends. When I went around the country, they stepped forward and they told me they are victims of an exploitative financing system. I want to tell them, my good friends, I have some good news for you. We are going, we are developing and by September this year, we will have a mechanism where you can get your border border that does not need petrol, that will be run on electricity, one that is financed by not a predatory system, but one that respects the interests of those who purchase the border borders. A healthy nation is liberated from human suffering and empowered to pursue their livelihoods and dreams without the hindrance and underperformance associated with ill health. A healthy nation is a happy nation. Freedom from disease is therefore a primary plank of our agenda to perfect self-government. We are committed to do affordably, inclusively, and in a manner that enables Kenyans to receive quality medical attention from the comfort of their homes. Towards this end, we are reforming the National Health Insurance Fund to meet the urgent needs of Kenyans at the bottom of the socioeconomic structure by actualizing its purpose as a social medical insurance facility. Secondly, we have committed to deliver universal health coverage that enables every Kenyan attain dignified health care at the minimum cost of subscription fee. Thirdly, we have collaborated with county governments 
whom we support wholeheartedly. And I want to commend all county governments for the exemplary work they are doing around health as a devolved function. We have collaborating with the county governments to recruit community health workers, uh, promoters throughout the country. 100,000 of them will be recruited under this program and this number as will, will make it avail will make every one promoter available for 100 households. This means that each promoter will be, will be tasked with visiting Kenyans at their homes to determine whether, they are, whether any condition need to be managed through healthier lifestyle or basic medical attention. They will also be tasked with enabling patients with chronic conditions manage their medication, diet, and general well-being in a manner that makes hospitalization sometimes unnecessary. Finally, the promoters will facilitate early detection of conditions for referral to comprehensive attention in the spirit of effective healthcare management. Ladies and gentlemen, the imperative of Madaraka mandates us to build a strong, democratic, prosperous nation through the successful pursuit of high productivity and competitiveness. Industrialization and technology innovation is one such movement. All these things require people who are all empowered with knowledge, skills, and understanding not only to effectively participate as informed citizens of a democracy, but also to pursue meaningful livelihoods and perform their share of economic production and even go further and imagine, create and build the Kenya of our future. Education, therefore, matters for our freedom and self-reliance and is the enabler and optimizer of every other undertaking. We have taken all possible measures and pursued every available option to actualize our vision to make education at all levels accessible, affordable, and inclusive, and removed social and economic barriers to the attainment of the highest education by all Kenyans. Beyond subsidizing primary and secondary education in all our public and uh, uh, public primary and day secondary schools, we have reimagined higher education financing to deliver equity and broader access to all Kenyans with special attention to enabling the most vulnerable learners to realize their right to education. We have also employed 35,000 teachers in a historic and unprecedented drive to improve the national teacher-pupil ratio and enhance performance. Additionally, we are redesigning the competence-based education curriculum to make it responsive to our education needs at the point of our social, cultural, and economic development. Finally, the National Open University will obtain its charter in the course of this month. And as we speak, courses are being uploaded for commissioning and later this year Kenyans will have the opportunity to go to university from the comfort of their homes online. For long, tertiary education in Kenya has been a privilege for the most fortunate, while university education was the exclusive entitlement of the elite. Not anymore. Amanda Ko, I unveiled a new funding model for higher education that will make the universities and technical training fully inclusive, financially robust, and capable of competing with their peers globally while contributing to our national socioeconomic transformation through innovation, research, and development. The model is aimed at financially supporting increasing numbers of students enrolling in these institutions and ensuring that those from households at the bottom of the socio-economic structure enjoy equal education opportunities. The eternal conundrum of Kenya's integrity agenda revolves around the question of who will watch over the trustees of public interest. 
and who will watch over the watchman? These questions do not arise because we have low trust. Rather, they exist because we have high expectations. Given that these expectations are legitimate in a technologically driven new millennium, we are increasingly resorting to technology as the answer to our transactional efficiency challenges. From the election results portal for our democracy to the Hustler Fund for MSMEs and the means testing instrument for higher education, as well as registration of farmers and distribution of fertilizer, digital technology is enabling the government to deliver services efficiently and to give citizens confidence that the system is fair and incorruptible. We must therefore take a moment today to celebrate technology in general and in particular Kenyan fintech and other innovations that are making it possible for us to serve Kenyans to the best possible standard. I remind all Kenyans who work in technology and everyone who uses technology that our forefathers fought with basic technology against a technologically superior superpower and won our freedom. We have a duty to deploy the best innovations and technologies to make Kenya efficient, competitive, and prosperous. I am persuaded that technology holds the key to improving efficiency, enabling inclusion, promoting transparency and integrity, deepening trust, and strengthening public confidence in government service provision. This is the reason why we are digitizing government information and taking public services online. On this day, I invite all Kenyans to embrace the new era of e-governance, which empowers people everywhere, including the majority at the bottom of the economic structure, to access government services at their convenience through their mobile devices. Since the advent of e-citizen, government gradually increased the number of services available on the platform from 391. The rate of increasing of increase of onboarded services is now shifting to a new radical trajectory. Today, 3,770 services have been onboarded and fully operational. Another 3,000 are on course to being completed. We expect 5,000 services to be online by the end of this month. Our ambition is to offer every government service on e-citizen platform by the end of this year. Finally, as we contemplate all the achievements we are celebrating today, let us reflect on the noble motivations and visions which inspired our heroic freedom fighters to make such immense sacrifices for the sake of freedom, not just for themselves, but also for the rest of their people who were not willing or able to join the struggle. Why did these heroes embrace such profound risk and danger in pursuit of a benefit that everyone else would enjoy? The answer must not only define our attitudes to public service, but it must also shape our understanding of the reasons and values that underlie collective undertakings and social policies. For our freedom fighters, a country in which anyone was unfree and oppressed was not worth living in. We have a duty to translate this truth into our political, social, and economic affairs. Our collectiv collectivist spirit that anchors competitive individual enterprise encapsulates this magnificent ethos. We owe each other certain duties as members of a community that we call a nation. Whenever we can do anything to make another person's life better, at no or little cost to ourselves, we have a solemn obligation to proceed and do it. There is fundamental, a fundamental level that at which we are morally obligated to think about our duties to the unemployed youth. 
vulnerable communities struggling in slums and other people at risk of exclusion. Their struggle for dignity as human beings appeals to our duty of moral consideration. Their complicated pursuit of livelihood can potentially complicate our stable prospects. No human is an island. In community lies power, and to unlock that power, we must attend to our values and perform our obligations. That is why freedom fighters consider that is why freedom fighters consider the inherent morality of their cause to be sufficient reward. For example, those, are, those of us who are earning Kenya shillings 200,000 monthly will pay only 2,500 to build a fund that will help, help create millions of jobs for millions of our young people and bring a meal on the tables of many hustlers. This is a worthwhile contribution to make for the greater good of our nation, as indeed the freedom fighters who came before us did. As we continue to make progress in our pursuit of the transformation of our economy from the bottom going up, we must remain vigilant that no one is left behind and no resources are lost to waste and corruption.